Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Newton's Cradle Exploring Rational and Empirical Design with Engineering Biology. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Inscripta. To learn more, please visit inscripta.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd now like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Patrick J. Westfall. Senior Director of Cell Biology at Inscripta. Patrick, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you. Um, we'll start off with a little bit of, of introducing myself uh, and kind of how I came to, to be at this position to talk to you today, both uh, the tools that I've been part of building and the experiences that I've had. So I um, always like to start out with my little Grateful Dead Bears here and talk about uh, my adventures in engineering biology so far. Uh, started out um, as a uh, undergrad at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana, where I had my first introduction to science, working in an undergrad lab, you know, washing the dishes. I think it's where all all great science starts with, with washing and having clean dishes. From there, I went on to the University of Georgia, uh, where I have my PhD in botany uh, from the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Uh, and then from there, I started my postdoctoral work after my PhD uh, at UCSF working with a doctor by the name of Dr. Ira Herskowitz, studying uh, yeast signaling and yeast physiology, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, and then continue that postdoc on over at UC Berkeley, working with a professor named by the name of Jeremy Thorner. Both of those were experts in the field of, of yeast physiology and yeast biology. After I finished my postdoc work, I entered into industry. Uh, my very first job was a scientist one at a company called Amherst Biotechnologies, located in Emeryville, California. Uh, here I've got to work on uh, industrial, uh, in the industrial setting for the first time, uh, looking at making a class of compounds called terpenes and engineering terpene production uh, in microbes such as Saccharomyces and E. coli that are then scaled up and produce interesting novel molecules uh, that go into various products. From Amherst, uh, I ended up going back to the Midwest, uh, ended up back up in Indiana for a while, working for Dow AgroSciences out of Indianapolis, Indiana. This is where I got my first introduction into genome editing. Uh, in this case, not working on microbes and mammalian cells, but actually working on plant cells, looking at corn and soybean and, and kind of those row crops that you expect to see back in, in the great Midwest and working on how to do precision engineering using genome editing technology to improve crop performance. After my time at Dow, I ended up going back into the San Francisco area. I worked for a company called Zymergen, where I was the senior director for biological engineering and exploratory research for about four years. And that's been followed by the last year and a half where I've been at Inscripta, a genome engineering technology tool development company, as a senior director of the cell biology group. So throughout my career, I've always worked on, on microbes with the occasional dabbling in plants, um, but uh, brought a lot of products to market and built a lot of interesting tools. And I kind of want to bring that experience uh, to the, the seminar today and talk about um, how I've combined both the ideas of, of rational engineering and really hypothesis-driven engineering uh, and combine those to make progress and make products that are on market using a rational means too. So if you're interested in bringing products to market, uh, and this is kind of in the industrial setting, although I think it has applications in, in the academic pure research setting too, there are some things that you need to, to consider when it comes to strain development. It, it, it's, a, it's a complex process and making good choices at the very early stages is, is absolutely critical to having success. And some of those early choices in, include things like your strain selection. Uh, I've been in so many conversations throughout my career about, hey, do you work in an organism like E. coli or yeast that has a lot of tools, is really easy to work with, um, but doesn't necessarily scale in quite the same way that you want it to. Uh, it's hard to take a yeast or an E. coli and go to 200,000 liters. Um, or do you work with a strain that already makes a product, that already has some natural attributes that makes it acid tolerance or pH tolerant, um, but doesn't have the tools available? So the, the engineering may be more complex, but there's some inherent physiology that's, that's beneficial that will help you in your scale-up process. And those are important decisions to make early on. Uh, 
you also are going to be working on maximizing performance. I spent so much of my, my graduate school and research and postdoc, and for me, life existed on a Petri dish or in a shake flask. Um, and those are important first steps but they have nothing to do with what it looks like when you're actually trying to scale a product and produce it at 200,000 liters. And so things like how many grams per, per liter tighter or how many grams per liter per hour, which is yield, uh, am I getting at my product become really, really important because you can't run giant fermenters indefinitely. You wanna make product, you wanna make it fast and at very high levels. And then your toolbox. Um, like I said, this kind of ties back into strain selection. E. coli and, and yeast have big toolboxes. Um, but you know, may not be the, the best uh, strain to use. So do you need to develop a toolbox for your organism of interest? And you know, that toolbox means that you need to have better strains, better backgrounds. Uh, you need to know basic genetic elements, promoters, terminators, tags, those types of things. And methodologies for, for rapid testing, at the end of the day, uh, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, and you need to actually measure your outcome. And uh, this is from a, a article in Nature back in 2010, when synthetic biology was kind of really coming into into being. And there's five hard truths about synthetic biology we need to consider as you as you think about trying to scale a process. Uh, and those truths are that many of the parts are undefined. You know, physiology, cell biology is very complicated. Um, so there may be parts of, of, the, of the genome, parts of the the overall metabolic pathway that you don't understand. That's not defined. That is not predictable. Uh, the circuitry is unpredictable. You don't know if you put a strong promoter, quote unquote, strong promoter in front of a gene, if it's really gonna be strong expression. There's a lot of other things that go into the regulation of, of the gene or of a pathway you're trying to uh, you know, engineer. Uh, the complexity is unwieldy. You know, factorially, you look at some of these metabolic pathways that go into making products and they have you know, multiple genes, if not hundreds of genes in some cases, that all contribute to the ultimate output. And that complexity gets very, very uh, overwhelming very, very quickly. Uh, many of the parts that you're trying to work with are, are incompatible. Um, they look good on paper, but when you actually go and use them, it's, it's not compatible with your system. And finally, that the variability crashes the system. Um, we seem to think about, you know, culture and bacterial engineering as, um, you know, this, this thing in a fermenter, this thing in a shake flask, this thing in a shake plate. But reality is that we're looking at the mean of the productions of millions and millions of microbes. And in that, in that mean and in that variability, uh, you know, one cell mutating can overtake the system and crash it uh, if it stops producing and starts growing instead. So how do you how do you combat this? How do you deal with this? Well, the way to deal with this, um, as we'll talk about today, is generate a lot of diversity, generate a, a, a lot of a large space where you can look uh, for, for winners. There, there's an idea. There's an there's an old joke about uh, a man's out in the parking lot looking under a, a light, and a police officer walks up to him and says, "You know, what are you looking for?" He's like, "Oh, I dropped my keys." And the officer said, "Oh, around here." He goes, "No, over there in the dark. But this is where the light is." As scientists, we tend to look where the light is. We tend to look um, only in those things that we know. But to really make progress, and as we'll talk about today, um, you want to look everywhere as much as, as broadly as possible. And that means you need to generate a lot of diversity, and you need to look, um, take that diversity and then combine it as quickly as possible. So to start out with, um, there's an analogy that I, I like to use. So as, as, a, as a kid growing up, my dad had a, um, I guess the term today would be a, a, a man cave or a cave. And in that uh, basement, he had a, had a bar, a wet bar. And on top of the bar was a bunch of, of yeah, I guess we refer to as bar games. We had dart boards and those types of things. But one of the things that sat on top of his bar was this uh, old, I don't know if it's a toy or what it is, but it's called Newton's Cradle. And it's the idea that uh, the conservation of motion, that you have these five steel balls hanging by a thread and you take the one on the end and you let it go and it swings back and forth. And that conservation of motion means that only the outer balls will actually go back and forth. And so this is the analogy that I want to use um, as we approach biological engineering or engineering biology and think about it in this context of Newton's Cradle. And in the context of Newton's cradle, to go back to a cartoon image here, if Newton's cradle is engineering biology, you have these two extremes that, that kind of follow this conservation of, of motion. On, on the left-hand side, you have empirical engineering. These are the things that you're engineering for that space that you don't know, the unknown unknowns, if you will. Um, the approaches you take in empirical engineering are selections. Uh, you do mutagenesis. You look for an improved phenotype some way but you're not intentionally uh, 
uh, engineering a pathway or engineering a gene, you're just looking at diversity expressly for the idea of trying to find some sort of improvement. At the other extreme is hypothesis-driven engineering. And this is what uh, a lot of synthetic biology likes to embrace, but as we just talked about, it's highly complicated and very difficult to work through this space where everything is purely rationally driven. Um, both are useful. You need to have both approaches, but the reality is if you just have one um, to all exclusion, you're, you're gonna get stuck. You're not, you're not gonna make progress. So thinking about this, this Newton's cradle, thinking about the, those five areas, I think you start with the, the centerpiece, that center steel ball. And what is the centerpiece? The piece that doesn't move, the piece that is, is I guess the, the known knowns, and that is your core knowledge. So when you start a project, when you start doing your engineering, you know the organism. Are you gonna work in yeast? Are you gonna work in E. coli? Are you gonna work in bacillus? So you know the organism, you know its physiology, you know what you can feed it and what you can't feed it. And for the most part, at this point, we know its metabolic pathways. We know how it's going to consume sugar or some other uh, metabolite. We know how that carbon can flow through the system. We can measure that. So this is the, the core knowledge, the things that are, have been known for a while or can be known that are pretty you know, immobile. The middle ball doesn't move. You don't see any motion in the middle ball. It stays there. Now you kind of move a step out. You go either direction. And as you go towards the empirical in engineering direction, now you start to make assumptions. You, you, you have problems like, is your product toxic? You know, are there regulatory networks? Are, you know, is there some sort of feedback mechanism? Is there enzyme evolution where an enzyme doesn't have a, a KCAT or a KM that it's quite right and you want to improve that KCAT, KM? I call these assumptions because these problems will arise, but you don't necessarily have a rational approach on how you're going to fix them. If it's toxic, do you evolve the cells in the presence of the products that overcomes that toxicity? If it's regulatory networks, do you change out the promoters and terminators so you have a regulatory element that is under your control? If it's enzyme evolution, do you do saturation mutagenesis across that entire enzyme looking for some variant that gives you a better K, CAT, or KM? So there are things that you can know about, but you don't know the solution set. On the other hand, if you go to the right, to the more hypothesis-driven engineering, now you start to look at what we call metabolic engineering for the most part. There's a knowledge base that you can you know, actually track and measure things. So for example, metabolic flux, you can feed radioactive carbon to a cell and follow those carbons through the cell, through the process and actually measure that. Uh, you can look at redox balance, same way, look at your NADH and ADPH and look how that changes over time. You can actually measure this. And in those measurements, you know something and in that knowledge, you can then engineer to, say, adjust the redox balance so that it is balanced and you do have the right amount of NAD and NADPH at the end of your pathway. So everything works out and you're not losing a bunch of energy into turning over that, that redox balance. And finally, we find ourselves out at the, the edges, um, really where a lot of the work takes place, where that motion in Newton's cradle takes place. So again, we'll go to the empirical engineering, the a-rational engineering, if you will. And over here, you're, you're left with tools like evolution. You know, can, can cells under a certain strain or a certain stress evolve to produce a phenotype of, of interest to you? You can speed evolution up by uh, doing mutagenesis, adding UV or EMS, something to essentially intentionally damage the DNA in the cell, and in that damage, make some sort of change that hopefully has a beneficial effect. Um, or you can do even to some extremes, um, which is, is an advent that's more recently part of the synthetic biology world, which is genome scanning, where you go and look at the promoter, the regulatory element in front of every single open reading frame uh, in the genome and change them all uh, at once or all you know, singularly and see, does that have an effect? Um, on the other end, you have your hypothesis-driven research. Uh, and this is strain improvement where you're very intentional. So you put in a pathway of, of known kinetics, of known biology. Um, you, you look at it, um, you know, uh, heterologous enzymes that intentionally you've picked out to see if they have better properties. You're putting them in the genome and looking at performance. Uh, this is what we call pathway engineering, pathway insertion. Uh, there's a part of this also that goes back to the fermentation, the scale, which is process control. So in some cases, you may have a product that is sensitive to nitrogen, so you can control that in your fermentation process. Um, but all very rational, intentional, thoughtful ways to, to engineer uh, a particular organism. And so what you have is this, uh, in order to make progress, to really do it, if you're only in one extreme, you can make some progress, but you're eventually going to get stuck. 
And you can go back and forth. And it's, it's through this back and forth that you make progress, that you are able to bring products to market quickly, that you're able to make strain improvements very, very quickly. Um, you can look, there are some examples that are, are, are really well known, in which case you did have one extreme. And there's products on the market that came from that one extreme. So over here on the left, under the A-Rational Engineering, there's penicillin. Uh, a great story, um, penicillin discovered in World War II, um, saves, has saved uh, millions of lives over the years. But honestly, it was isolated from a moldy cantaloupe out of Peoria, Illinois, up in the back of a grocery store in Peoria, Illinois. And they took that moldy cantaloupe, uh, they were able to culture in these flat bottom flask, rooms and rooms and rooms full of these flat bottom flasks to uh, get penicillin. They could then treat soldiers in, in World War II. Uh, it's amazing what they did, considering they had no rational engineering tools. They used to use strictly mutagenesis. And this is the first example of mutagenesis ever being used to make a product where they just blasted the cells and selected cells that made more of this penicillin compound. Uh, and within a year and a half through scale to working with Merck and Pfizer and the USDA, they went from having something that made literally milligrams per, per liter of cell culture to enough uh, penicillin to treat every single soldier who was injured on, on the storming of the beaches of Normandy. Uh, an incredible uh, example of uh, progress made through um, uh, mutagenesis and, and engineering and, and scale-up process. Uh, another example is uh, citric acid. So citric acid is made by a filamentous fungus called Aspergillus niger. Uh, and what you have here on the left is a picture of what the Aspergillus niger looks like. It has these kind of fluffy ball heads that uh, contribute to mold, the mold spores. However, when you actually take citric acid and put it in production for food preservatives or for making uh, soda, these types of things, it's really, really important industrial chemical, it changes its morphology and it has this kind of clustered shape that looks very, very different than what the wild type aspergillus looks like. Uh, and it's amazing. This was all done, again, through selection, through a-rational means, through just looking for phenotypes that allow this to grow in, in large scale fermentation processes. What's amazing is if you look what's on the left and you look what's on the right, the differences between those two strains is only about 40 changes. 40 changes in the genome that consist of millions and millions of base pairs results in that drastic phenotypic change. And it goes from something that's moldy and gross to something that makes a product that we use in everyday life. Another one I like, uh, this is a product that I actually got a, got a touch bit a little bit when I worked at Dow AgriSciences called Spinosin. Um, great story here where some uh, engineers or some, some scientists from Eli Lilly were down in the Virgin Islands on vacation. And back in the 80s, it was very typical for these pharmaceutical companies who were looking for new natural products to send their employees out with little plastic bags and ask them to take soil samples uh, and bring soil samples back. And then they would culture organisms from those so that soil and say, hey, does it make anything that has a particular phenotype that we like? So one of their employees was at a rum factory down in the Virgin Islands, had a little plastic bag, took a soil sample from that rum factory, outside that rum factory, brought it back, and they were able to propagate this actinomycete called Sacropolysporus spinosa. And it turns out it makes a compound called spinosin, and that compound is a great insect repellent. Uh, it's used by Alonco, has a topical treatment to treat your pets for fleas and ticks. It's also used in the agricultural space, has a uh, spray to prevent insects for especially crops like blueberries. It's been engineered over the time. It was selected from a soil sample, and it's been engineered over time uh, through muted serial mutagenesis with very little hypothesis-driven engineering to make the product we use today. And finally, what I'm going to come back to is, is lysine, and uh, lysine is made by a bacteria called Cronibacterium. Uh, and you'll see a picture here of a, of a movie that came out quite a while back called from uh, called The Informant, with starring Matt Damon. And we'll talk about why this is important in a second. But again, this is a example of a product that comes naturally from a, a microbe that already existed that's been uh, mutated over years to make super high levels of, of lysine. If you ever drive through uh, Decatur, Illinois, and there's a smell in the air, that smell is these large fermentations from ADM producing lysine from Cronibacterium. Now, in the last 20 years, uh, really, we've seen a shift from that kind of pure empirical engineering over to the more hypothesis-driven engineering. So here we're looking at, at products where, although maybe some empirical methods were used, they were largely hypothesis-driven. And one of the first products that ever came to market was 1,3-propane diol, which was a collaboration between uh, Tate and & Lyle and 
um, DuPont. Uh, and this is a, a small molecule. It's produced in E. coli, and it's used to make sustainable plastics. So it's plastic not made from petroleum, but plastic made from fermentation. Uh, another one, and one that I've actually personally worked on, uh, is a product called Artemisinin. So this was a project that was sponsored at my very first job at Amherst by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where um, it was identified, uh, this plant shown on the right, Artemisia annua, um, was identified as making an active compound back in the late 60s that would allow uh, soldiers to be treated for malaria. So it was it was developed, um, used as a tea by the, by the Chinese who were supporting the North Vietnamese. Uh, and when their soldiers would come down with malaria, they'd brew a tea from the leaves of this plant and that and their soldiers would get better. So in the late 60s, they identified the active compound artemisinin. Uh, the problem was that because it only came from the plant, the supply was really, really unstable. So you couldn't get enough of the artemisinin. On top of that, because of the structure of the compound, uh, it wasn't really stable to produce. So it didn't have a very short shelf life. And so what the people at Amherst did, the group that I was part of, is we took the genes out of this plant, Artemisia annua, we engineered them in the Saccharomyces cerebesia, the yeast shown here on the left. We were able to make um, artemisinin through fermentation of yeast uh, and, and basically stabilize that supply of anti-malarial drugs so that anybody who needs to get treated for malaria can now have access to artemisinin. It's not seasonally dependent. Uh, it also had the benefit of really stabilizing the supply, the price and supply chain. And finally, another example of a product that, uh, you know, we, we, we um, use through rational engineering, um, and this is a sweetener called RevM. So there's a, several companies out there who are working on uh, engineering some sort of microbe, either E. coli or Saccharomyces, to uh, make this uh, uh, particular sweetener that's normally found in plants, engineer that pathway into microbes and produce a large scale substitute for pure cane sugar. Uh, that has all the quality but none of the calories of, of, of sugar. So all the sweetness but none of the calories of sugar. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, I give these examples that are kind of extreme examples, but, you know, the problem becomes, I think, and, and what I, my hypothesis that I'll argue that if you're overly indexed any one of these approaches, uh, you'll find yourself back into a corner. You'll find yourself kind of at a, a local, um, local local max, but it's not the ultimate max. And really, if you want to make progress quickly, and I've seen this time and time again, it's even with all those products that I've worked on, uh, that you need to have this back and forth between hypothesis-driven engineering, putting the pathways in, and then empirical engineering, looking broadly to make progress. And so this is where your Newton's cradle comes in, where you're going back and forth. You know, you go hypothesis-driven, then you hit you back to your core knowledge, then you go empirical. And oftentimes, when you find yourself in these bottlenecks, you can get out of that empirical space by doing rational engineering, or if you find yourself in a rational corner, you can get out of it by doing empirical engineering. Uh, which brings kind of to the next part of, you know, where technology is going, where we are today. And I always like this quote. This is a scientist mathematician from, from Britain named Freeman Dyson. Uh, he fought a little bit out of favor because he was a very big climate denier, but I don't think uh, him being a climate denier actually, uh, um, I don't think him being a climate denier changes the idea that this is a, a true concept. And his, his quote is, new directions in science are launched by new tools, much more often than by new concepts. The effect of a concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in a new way. The effect of a tool-driven revolution is to discover things that have yet to be explained. And on this next slide, I kind of talk through this because uh, in my 20 years of doing you know, biological engineering, the tools have changed, and the way the tools have changed have allowed us to make progress quicker. Um, I talked about being an undergrad doing research at, at Purdue University. Back then, um, it was an entire PhD in, you know, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, to just to clone a gene or two. To clone and sequence a gene or two was your PhD. Now, you know, cloning a gene is simply a, a click button order from IDT or from Twist or from one of the many vendors, and you get it two or three days later in some cases. Um, so what used to take, you know, five years can now be done essentially overnight. Uh, and so what I have here in the kind of the upper left corner is, is how we think about the, the engineering cycle when it comes to train engineering, which we call design, generate, test, and learn, and inscripta. And think about how design has changed. So that left corner, which I realize is kind of hard to see, this was the very first genome editing program I ever used. Uh, it was called uh, Gene Runner. Uh, and if you still look online, you can get the abandonware version of this. But it was literally these chunky blocks of A's, C's, G's, and T's that you could go in and, and engineer on Windows NT. 
Now compare that to uh, the designer software that Inscripta has, has worked with. So whereas I would have to work with a 500 base pair chunk of DNA that I uploaded myself, Inscripta's automated design software and other design softwares out there allow you to upload the entire genome at once and engineer and make designs that will allow you to engineer the entire genome. Um, if you would have thought about what it would take, and it would have taken weeks, if not months, if not years to engineer in that old Gene Runner platform, the types of things that the designer platform and Inscripta um, or other designer platforms out there can, can do in a matter of, of hours. So the software has been a, a, obviously a huge impact into this engineering biology revolution. Uh, think about the generate part, automation. So um, most of my early career was spent holding one of these blue rain and pipettes. We still all have them and moving clear liquids from tube to tube. Um, it got better. Uh, here's an example of, of automation. This is a, a T-CAN robot where all of a sudden we can move liquid from tube to tube 96 at a time. Uh, and then we'll talk about today a little bit is let's get rid of, of all the plastic wear. Let's get rid of all those tubes and let's look at the individual cells. And that's where this Onyx platform uh, comes in and the tools around designed around Onyx using genome editing technology that looks you lets you look at massively parallel libraries um, all at once um, in, in you know screens and selections in such a way that you don't need to move clear liquid from tube to tube. When it comes to tests, I, I mentioned you know it used to be a, a big deal to uh, sequence a single gene for your PhD, and that's kind of what this gel shows. Uh, for those of you who may have been around for a while. Uh, this is an old school S35 polyacrylamide gel that you expose to uh, a film. And then you would, depending on which lane that band showed up in, would tell you if it's an A, C, G, or T. And you could maybe get a couple of hundred base pair read from this very kludgy gel system. Uh, now contrast that to a MySeq where I, can up, I get my whole genome sequence back the next day. In addition, the analytical equipment. Uh, you know, this is the typical GC mass spec. Um, I still remember I was so proud of myself when I programmed my first GC. I could detect the compound of interest in 26 minutes per sample. It was awesome. Uh, now you have things like rapid fire mass spec where that same sample can be sampled in seconds. Uh, and you can test thousands of samples. So the tools on the test side have really, really improved. that allow us to make progress really, really quickly. And then coming back to the software, um, you know, I, I put the, the picture of, of Gene Runner up here. Uh, if I did make a change, if I did do sequencing, I had to upload my new sequence back in the Gene Runner and then look base pair by base pair to see if it was there. Um, it was very, very time intensive, um, very, very kludgy. Uh, compare that now to what we kind of get back from uh, software where you can look at a whole genome and say, right there, that base pair changed. Everything else in the genome is exactly the same, but this is the change that we made, uh, again, in a process that takes maybe a day or two at the very most. Uh, it's incredible the speed at which we can move now because these tools are available. The knowledge base, I would argue, to do some of these things has been around for a long time, but these tools allow us to do more of it, do it more rapidly, uh, and do it with higher uh, precision and, and, and uh, quality. Which brings us to the Onyx platform. And so I'm gonna go through some examples uh, of where this Onyx platform, now we're showing the instrument here, but it is the software, it is the the uh, way we design our, our architecture is the way we use genome editing. Uh, so we look at it at the back end to get the, the answers that we want. Um, but the Onyx platform in, in this case is a tool that's been developed by Inscripta. Uh, and it ties back into what I was talking about doing rational and empirical approaches. And these are the examples I'll give. This platform um, allows you to look very, very broadly, but also in some cases very, very intentionally to make progress. You can make libraries of tens of thousands of variants all at once, screen those variants and find improvements uh, in a matter of days. Uh, it would used to be processes that would take months at a time to identify the improvements and stack them. And what makes this different? What makes this different is this idea of if you wanted to do rational engineering in traditional manners, uh, companies I've worked for uh, do this now, uh, you have to go and, and let's say in this case we're going to use CRISPR, uh, you want to have an intentional design. You have to take your strain. You have to put it into an individual well of a 96 well plate. You have to provide your guide RNA in the case of the CRISPR, your uh, Cas9 system of some sort, uh, and your donor DNA as separate pieces. Those all have to be, you know, uh, aliquoted and hit picked out into individual wells. You can do this 96 at a time and scale as it is appropriate. Uh, 
The Onyx platform takes those individual pieces, those individual partitions, and we actually make the cell itself the partition. And we do this by combining the guide RNA and the donor RNA all into one construct and then barcoding it such that each cell gets a unique uh, editable uh, system. In the editable system, uh, the cells can be transformed. They'll take up this DNA. The guide RNA will guide the cut. The donor, I, I guide, the donor DNA will guide the, the paste. And, and then when you have a cell that looks like a winner, that has a phenotype that is of interest, all you have to do is do a very simple PCR and uh, Sanger sequencing reaction, read the barcode and say, oh, I made a change in this gene and here it is. Uh, it's incredibly fast, incredibly efficient. And uh, the part that I like is you go from going through this number of 96 well plastic plates to a much, much smaller number. So uh, I, I like the green aspect of it too. Uh, you don't use nearly as many plastic tips and all my time as a postdoc and a grad student going from tube to tube with clear plastic P10 pipette tips can be replaced um, by this kind of high throughput, rapid barcoded genetic system. So uh, that's, that's the idea of, of tools and, and the impact that they have on uh, engineering biology, how they can benefit both in the rational and empirical manner. I'm gonna have some examples I'm gonna go through next. So uh, the first one I'll go through is, is a uh, detailed example on, on kind of pathway improvement. And I like this example because I want to bring back uh, Matt Damon in this movie, The Informant. Um, I grew up in central Illinois, not too far from Decatur, um, which is where ADM is located. Uh, and ADM uh, at the time was subject to one of the largest SEC fines ever. It turns out that ADM a company out of, of Japan called Ajinomoto, a company out of Korea called Sejeldong. Um, all these people who were producing lysine, which is a, a small amino acid that's used in animal feed, uh, were essentially colluding to price fix and drive the price of, of lysine up uh, artificially high. And um, The Informants is a movie about an insider at ADM who basically whistle blew to the SEC about this price fixing and at the time, the fine that was given, kind of this is a short uh, part of over here in the Department of Justice, uh, was the highest fine ever given by the SEC um, to a company uh, for price fixing. So um, lysine itself, like I said, it's, it's a valuable commodity. If you drive through Decatur, Illinois, you can smell the lysine tanks. You can see the lysine tanks. They're impressive, 600,000 liter tanks that are, are pumping out this small amino acid. Um, and then feeding it to, to, to pigs and chicken has part of the um, you know, way to, to get them up to the, the growth that the thing can go into our food production. The lysine pathway itself is, is very straightforward. There's 19 core genes in the pathway, uh, 26 uh, transcription factors. Kind of on the left here, you can see uh, that core pathway, all the, the genes involved. If you just took out all the rest of metabolism and drew straight lines from gene to gene, that's what the pathway would look like. And so um, we wanted to do a proof of, a proof of concept showing that this uh, combination of both rational and a-rational engineering of looking broadly could have an impact and, and quickly make progress to improve strains uh, that were making valuable chemicals like lysine or valuable molecules like lysine. And so the approach that we took is knowing those core 19 pathways, we looked across the entire genome. We designed uh, uh, libraries on the uh, Onyx platform using the software that combined, I guess what you'd call semi-rational ideas. So you went through the genome and you knocked out, that's what KO stands for here in this kind of circle. You designed, uh, made designs that knocked out every single gene in E. coli, independently of whether uh, you thought it hit the lysine pathway or not. And I call this kind of rational, rational a-rational because um, rationally you're making knockouts, but a-rationally you're looking at everything at once. On top of that, we looked at, uh, you know, kind of the, the core uh, genes in E. coli and uh, looked at every single gene. So the ones that were not absolutely essential. So 3,676 genes. And we took the promoter, the driver in front of every one of those genes and replaced it with a novel promoter of varying strength. So what you can see on the right here is a promoter ladder. So these are our promoter sequences that are uh, of varying strength. So the idea is if you put this sequence in front of a gene, it will have some effect on that gene, either make that gene express higher or make that gene express lower. And what you can see here is we picked five different strengths of promoters out of this library provided by iGEM 
and we rationally engineered, but then a rationally across every gene, one of these promoters in front of um, every single gene. So we have five different promoter strengths in front of every single gene. And then we screened it. So rationally, we put a promoter in front of every gene, rationally knocked out everything, but we also a rationally looked at everything at once. And this is what the outcome is. We looked at 18,000 isolates, um, and then we looked at, okay, the mean here is showing it as, as zero. Uh, and we looked for those things that really had an impact, either increase the amount of lysine coming out or decrease the amount of lysine coming out. Sometimes you learn things that have negative effects. And so looking there at that kind of, of, of space, you can see that there's a number of things in the far left in that knockout collection that improve production of lysine. There's a number of, of things in this, what we call the pathway. So these are the core genes of the pathway, those 19 genes, where we either did promoter swaps, um, put different promoters in front of it, did a small saturation library where we changed the uh, amino acid that was already on, on a particular uh, uh, gene in that pathway to a arginine or a histidine or a asparagine. Um, or we did uh, the promoter swap shown here on the, on the far right. We took those libraries um, that had a total of 200,000 designs. We screened 18,000 of them on a rapid fire mass spec that took seven seconds per sample. And in that space, we found some really interesting things. So for example, one of the genes is really key to this pathway is called DAP-A. Uh, it's feedback inhibited by lysine. Um, so we looked at this one saying, okay, what's that feedback inhibition? Let's look at every single amino acid on this enzyme and let's change it. Let's do site-directed mutagenesis and change it to every one of the other 19 amino acids that possibly could be. It's also nice we had a control built in here. So one of these amino acids, E84, we could change to a threonine, um, tyrosine, sorry, uh, threonine. Anyway, get my, get my amino acids mixed up here. Um, but this is a validated hit that was in, in the literature. And um, in this case, we knew that if this one came up, we were gonna get an improvement in, in the lysine um, uh, hit here. So we, we had something internally, we knew that if this would come up in, in our design library. And so we made progress. So going here to a, a background, and these are color coded by the various uh, kind of uh, uh, engineering that was, was done. So you start over on the left hand side with wild type, and this is the amount of lysine produced uh, by wild type. The red bar at the top of the graph shows where this, um, you know, E84 to tyrosine uh, mutation is. And uh, that's, that's what we want to get to. So that's the baseline. So the wild type actually wild, it produces below that line. And if we just looked in the background at either genome-wide knockouts or genome-wide promoter swaps thrown in blue and green here, we could find that there are certain genes that we could hit uh, looking in this background of this already improved variant that would actually push our uh, production of lysine up even higher. We then started stacking those hits, we combined those hits. So you start out with E84T, and all of a sudden we find this DAP-A, um, that same version, but within one of these promoters that came out of the promoter library. Uh, and so we have now a 970X production increase over what the wild type strain was producing. Uh, we continue to screen these libraries, and now we combine these hits, so we stack these hits, so both that promoter on DAP-A, as well as that point mutation, and now we're up to 10,000 times higher production of lysine. And then on top of that, you start looking at other places in the genome that had a positive impact. So in this case, the gene GLND with a strong promoter has now given us a 14,000 X production improvement of lysine. Uh, I think the other thing to point out to you is if you wanted to do this kind of engineering, it would have normally have taken you months and months and months and, uh, to go through this. This design, this both empirical and rational approach, we were able to do this in 14,000 X improvement in lysine production in about five weeks. Uh, using the Onyx instrument, using this technology that combines um, the various aspects of, of rational and irrational approaches. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you can look at, at the protein, you can look at the pathway, you can look at the genome. The approach that I just showed you here as an example hits all these, the protein specifically, the pathway uh, generally, and the genome writ large. And you get about a total of 2,000, 200,000 edits in this case um, but what you can see here is if you actually have a uh, plot a graph. And so uh, this is this is the graph of production in two different media. So kind of a, a rich media and then a production media. And you look at where these hits are, the, these winners that you are that led to that drastic improvement in lysine. So you want things in the upper right corner. You, know, you want things that are improved in both the media conditions you want to test. 
uh, and you can get there very, very quickly. This took five weeks and look at all these hits that were uh, generated. And some of these had never been seen before. These were all, um, in, in some cases there was the control, but in many of these cases, all these dots you're seeing here, all these improvements you're seeing here are things that we didn't know about the complexity of biology and lysine production that we can now uh, look at and, and design the next library and design the next suite to push that production even higher. Real quickly here, I got a couple other examples that, that may be relevant to products that are important in the, in the bioeconomy. Uh, the next example is specifically around protein production. Again, combining this, this rationale of using both, um, you know, uh, intentional ideas, promoter swaps, genome-wide knockouts, uh, with also looking large across the whole genome. So in this case, this is an example uh, done internally at Inscripta. We are using Saccharomyces cerevisia has our, our base strain, a uh, background called SynPK2, and we inserted a heterologous protein called CBH1. So CBH1 is a uh, cellobiohydrolase. Um, it's really important in the production of using cellulosic feedstocks, converting cellulosic feedstocks to sugar for production of valuable chemicals or ethanol. Um, so think about the ethanol plants back in the Midwest, you're feeding corn stover to be able to break down that corn stover into workable uh, carbon that can be converted into to biofuels is, is really important. So this was what CBH1 does. And so one of our scientists, Eric Abate, who's part of our applications development group, uh, sat down at his computer and in a couple hours generated seven different libraries uh, that he employed in parallel. And these seven libraries uh, included genome-wide knockouts, uh, genome-wide terminator insertion, so the three prime end was changed out, uh, and deletions across the entire genome. In addition, um, so those are kind of those unbiased genome-wide uh, knockouts. In addition, he did some rational engineering where he did uh, basically transcription factor binding sites. So TFBS stands for transcription factor binding sites. And he did these promoter insertions all across the genome and certainly in front of the positions in CBH1. In addition, he did enzyme engineering where he took that CBH1 gene and did uh, codon changes, changed every single amino acid to all the other possible amino acids. So these libraries were, were rather big, um, but in this idea that you don't have to look at everything to exhaustion, you can just screen a subset and find kits, that's exactly what he did. So for example, uh, in one library that had 5,000 different designs, he only screened about 1,000 of those, um, so only you know a small percentage of the coverage, um, but he was able to get eight uh, unique kits um, that we wouldn't have gotten through purely rational means. Um, and that's what's kind of shown here at, at the top. So again, looking at that chart, these are the various hits from the library. The baseline is one at the very bottom. You see it's divided into genome-wide uh, looking versus targeted looking on the gene, on the uh, around the gene, around the pathway. You get a nice combination of both rational and irrational hits, uh, and you can get a, a pretty drastic change in um, uh, production you know, over, the, over that base strain. Uh, and then you have the ability to go and combine this. And the thing that I think is great, all these changes, this would, you know, honestly, I can say in previous jobs, these kinds of changes, these types of libraries would have taken months, if not years to generate. Uh, Eric by himself was able to generate this data three months start to finish. A um, couple hours to design the libraries, wait for the oligos to get built, delivered back to him, transform the strains on the instrument, uh, and then screen those strains. And at the end of the day, he found 74 unique hits that had not been reported in the literature that had a positive impact on production of this particular protein. And then to kind of round it out, I want to give one other example. Um, and this has to do, so if this is protein production, how much protein you can make, this has to do with protein function, um, enzymology, if you will. Uh, in this case, one of our collaborators over at VIB in, in Europe had four key genes that were involved in uh, uh, membrane generation. So uh, these are the four genes shown here in the purple, red, and orange boxes. And she wanted to explore changing every single amino acid to other, every other possible amino acid across these four proteins. And what's really cool is with the Onyx system, this was not a, a labor-intensive uh, process. It didn't take very long. She uploaded her genome, picked her four genes, and said, do substitutions, clicked a button, uh, and then it generated the, the various edits. So in the case of LPXA, for example, all 5,257 edits were generated at a click of a button. And what you show over here on the right is, is a heat map. So at the bottom is the, the residue, um, which position, which amino acid position. On the left-hand side is the, the single letter code for every single amino acid that could be substituted in this case. And if you look very carefully at the top, you see these little bitty dots. 
these little bitty dots from all the work that had been done for, for many, many years in these four proteins, these little bitty dots are the residues that were shown to be uh, important and vital uh, in, in uh, membrane generation uh, across these four genes. And what's amazing to me is it's a relatively small set considering the combinatorial space of these four genes and all the amino acids you could make. Uh, and then when you look at the, at the heat map, what you can see is if you look in the horizontal direction, you see these kind of patches of white. And if you look close, you'll see, for example, proline is a very uh, poorly tolerated substitution. So you kind of see a horizontal line at the P there saying that, hey, amino acid substitution of proline at every one of the amino acids isn't a good choice to make. Um, but you look at every single amino acid, and it's not always the case. Now, if you look at the, at the um, vertical line, what you can see is that uh, we were able to identify essentially residues that are critical. Um, and that's this basically if you look uh, from top to bottom or, or bottom to top, uh, if you see a, basically a white line, this means that this is a residue that is critical, uh, that is important, and does not tolerate substitution very well. So these are other key residues that you might want to go after to understand the functionality of, of this enzyme. Uh, and so, you know, this is a much fuller map, a much more detailed map on the enzyme space that you can explore, uh, things that you can go after, things that you can substitute for, uh, things that you don't want to do. But it's a comprehensive map that allows you to uh, go on to the, the, the next national approach to improve these enzymes. And then finally, one final example, uh, and this is the idea of uh, taking a traditional methodology and doing what we call deconvolution, finding out the, the key changes that might have happened in a, in a change over time. So uh, there's a process called adaptive laboratory evolution. So this is the idea that you want a, a strain or a cell to be more tolerant to some stress, say uh, heat or pH, or in this case, uh, acid tolerance. So over the years, uh, through various um, literature-based methodologies, there are 992 uh, E. coli strains that have been generated uh, that show some sort of acid tolerance. Uh, you know, in these 992 strains, there are 372 identified variants, uh, 168 transposon insertions, and 542 knockouts, all that for some reason or another give you a phenotype that makes you acid tolerant. Uh, so what our collaborator did is it took all 992 of these changes and said, okay, which ones are, are really important? Which ones can really give me the best acid tolerance? Uh, and he designed those as part of the uh, Inscripta platform. So this is informed by a rational mutagenesis, but now it's a rational library. And he was able to take all 992 of those unique elements, uh, put them into a single library, expose them to, in this case, chimeric acid, and say, okay, which one make my cells more resistant? Which one make them less resistant? And find genes that are, are, are really key. Um, again, you wanna look at that, that far upper right con, uh, quadrant and say, what are those things that uh, truly make me the most acid tolerant? And then you can then map those residues of those genes that change, in this case, looking at RNA polymerase subunit alpha, so RPOA, and say, okay, uh, these green residues in the, in the crystal structure make the cell, uh, make the, the protein, make the, the cells more tolerant to acid. Uh, those in red are critical, they make it less tolerant. Um, so it's a way to, to take, you know, what would be a really, really hard to do A-B testing across 992 unique SNPs or unique changes. It's a way to do it all at once and let your winners rise to the top and uh, make progress and, and tip back towards either basic science or to the production of a, of a protein or a cluster of proteins here that are important to uh, conferring acid tolerance, which is important at scale. So those are my examples. Um, I think we have some, some time left for questions. I'm going to go ahead uh, and pause here and uh, let the moderator come back and, and let me know if there's any questions I can answer for, for anybody who listens. Thank you, Patrick, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right, let's get started. Our first question asks, one of the limitations of empirical engineering is an appropriate screening method. Often we are stuck with growth-based assays. Is this instrument capable of screening for non-growth-based uh, phenotypes, such as production? And if so, how, what screen does it use? 
cytometry perhaps? Right. Uh, so, so with relate, relation to this, what the instrument does is it allows you to do designs. It does the transformations for you. It, it basically normalizes the cells. So you have a library that's equally representative. What comes out the back end though um, is a, a pool of cells um, enough to do your experiments. But what we can't really predict is what people are going to do with it. Are you looking to make um, farnesine? Are you looking to make a, a polyketide? Are you looking to make whatever your product is? Because everybody's product is unique, um, you know, we're not in a position to dictate what your uh, screen or your, or your selection should be. Now, with that being said, um, you know, those limitations, things like cytometry become very important. We've developed a lot of our technology using cytometry, using fluorescent proteins, using cell sorters. Um, but we view that the the complexity uh, and the number of products that, that customers could make or, or people could make is way more vast than what we could possibly predict for a for a screen, whether it be empirical or rational. Um, so that is, you know, in the end of the day, if you can do the design easily, if you can do the build easily, if you can generate your material easily, the only problem becomes for companies to really focus on is how do you screen effectively? Great, thank you. Our next question asks, did your approach to biological engineering change if you are screening versus selecting for an outcome? Yeah, that's um, that's, that's interesting. So, so this idea of a screen versus selection, we should probably define that. So the idea of a screen is uh, you go through the process, you generate a bunch of diversity, but you're looking for more of some product. So you go back, you singulate the, the individual cells, you form a colony, you pick that colony, you array it in a 96 well plate. This is what we did with the lysine example for, for um, going back to the talk. Uh, and then you look and say, okay, which colony, which cell, which population produces more lysine? Um, on the other hand, if you're doing a selection, what you can do is take that population of cells and expose it to uh, you know, some sort of stress or some sort of uh, uh, something over time. And what happens is in that case that you can then look and, and see, okay, which uh, phenotypes and, and then relate that back to the barcode get enriched. So for example, let's say you wanted to look at uh, growing on glycerol. So you could take your, your yeast cell that has this massive generated library, you could grow it up in glycerol, and then after a two days of growing on glycerol, go and say, okay, what barcodes got enriched? What barcodes are now more present? Which barcodes fell out? Which, which designs fell out that are no longer compatible with growth on, growth on glycerol? So knowing if you're gonna do a screen or knowing if you're gonna do a selection does maybe change the types of things that you uh, would, would engineer in this approach. I still think the empirical methods are applicable, but maybe your rational methods may change if you're in that screening versus selection regime uh, and looking at your capacity to uh, find positive hits or, or winners, if you will. Great, thank you. This next one has three parts to it, and it asks, what is the range of species in the Onyx platform compatible with? What are the limitations of the Onyx platform in terms of species compatibility? And lastly, what characteristics does a species need to have to be compatible with the Onyx platform? Right. So, so the Onyx platform has its release now, is compatible with E. coli and Saccharomyces, although we are looking to expand that range to other organisms of industrial relevance. Uh, in the case of E. coli, we have two standard strains. Called, one is called uh, K-strain, uh, also known as MG1655. The other one is, is what we call B strains. So this is the kind of uh, protein expression strain, strains where proteases are, are knocked out. Uh, on the Saccharomyces side, we have two strains. One is S288C, which is the kind of standard academic laboratory strain of Saccharomyces. The other one is SynPK uh, and some variants, the PK2 or SynPK113D. Uh, in both those cases, uh, SynPK2 strains are considered to be more relevant to industrial scale. Um, and so there's a number of, of products made by uh, companies that use the SynPK2 strain. So those are the initial strains that, that we are, are supporting. With that being said, one of the tools that uh, Inscripta has developed is what we call a custom strain assessment library. So this is a library of about uh, 900 edits um, that are part of the, um, that we provide to our customers. And we allow them to take their strain, their E. coli or their Saccharomyces strain that is not one of our base strains, uh, deploy this library against it, and then look at the edit rate and see if that, if that the technology as it exists is compatible with their strains. Um, so this custom strain assessment is a really important key part uh, 
of making sure that the Onyx platform and the Onyx technology is compatible with um, the, the work that you are doing and with your strain um, that you're trying to, to work with. Great, thank you. This next question asks, how would you generate a combinatorial library? So to an expression, optimize a pathway of several enzymes. Yeah, so let's say you have uh, an, an example of, of a pathway that you know. Um, it could either be a native pathway or a heterologous pathway. Um, it's a very simple process of you upload your genome uh, that inc includes that pathway into the Inscriptor Designer software. Um, and in that Inscriptor Designer software, you then go to your, you know, those key genes um, that are mapped and really easy to find within the software. Uh, and let's say you want to do saturation eugenesis. You then take that gene and you have a choice. You can either pick out individual residues uh, and there's a drop down menu that says, what do you want to do? Do you want to do a, a deletion here? You want to do a substitution? You want to do a change? Uh, and through that, you can you can basically say, I want to change to every other amino acid. Uh, you can do that on individual residues or you can do it across the whole coding sequence. And then you just repeat that six times. Um, the first time I played with the designer software, so at my time at Amherst, I worked on terpene pathways. It's related to the mevalonate pathway that's native in yeast. Uh, once I learned the software, which took about a 15, 20 minute tutorial, I was able to do saturation eugenesis across the entire mevalonate pathway, across every single gene. It took me about 15 minutes of, of clicking buttons to design that type of library. So it, it's, it's really software driven. It's very simple, very uh, user interface positive that allows you to take the native genes, take your heterologous genes. Once your genome is uploaded, you can make any of those changes with the click of a button. And then you, you press order and you get a library back in a couple of weeks and then you go, you know, transform it and, and screen. Awesome. All right. Next question says, what are the challenges of incorporating Onyx to improve industrial strains? Um, you know, I, I think it starts with what we talked about a, a second ago is that custom strain assessment. So let's look at, at compatibility of your strain. Are you working in a haploid? Are you working in a diploid in the case of yeast? Are you working in one of these standard strains in E. coli? It's that custom strain assessment that says, hey, um, let's look at, at the um, compatibility. Um, and, and, you know, and then if it's not completely compatible, are there some things that we can do? Are there some things that we um, know about, uh, you know, your particular strain, it's sensitive to salt or this like that, that we can maybe change so the instrument uh, has some compatibility. For the most part, the instrument is very straightforward. You, you know, press some buttons and run the, run the, run the instrument. But um, if there are some known limitations on your particular industrial strain, uh, we have the ability to work within that, within the instrument to, to make changes that may make it more um, accessible to, to your particular strain. For the most part, we've found with our early customers in industrial space, um, those tweaks really aren't necessary. We already have a couple of protocols in place and if the first protocol doesn't work, we can go to the second one and we can get your strain to be, be compatible pretty quickly. All right, and it looks like we have time for one more question and this one also has two parts. It asks, are there plans to extend implementation to bacterial species other than E. coli? And if so, what are the main challenges of doing so? Yeah, it, I mean, it is part of our, our, our roadmap. Um, you know, we're not going to promise that it's going to be available to tomorrow, but it is part of the roadmap. It is part of the uh, technology that we are, are actively developing. Um, you know, in those other bacterial species, you can imagine that there are certain species that are of, of high industrial relevance. Um, and we're looking towards those as having the greatest impact. At the end of the day, we want to kind of democratize the bioeconomy. Uh, so finding those strains that are, are most uh, uh, accessible, um, that there is demonstration of scale and production at scale of important key enzymes um, are what's kind of driving that, that roadmap. Um, we do expect, um, as part of the Onyx platform, uh, it was intentionally designed with some flexibility. So if we do have to change our process and our parameters to make it acceptable with, with new species, um, it doesn't require us to make a new instrument. Uh, we can make the instrument compatible with those species of interest. Species like, you know, Bacillus or Streptomyces or Pseudomonas um, are certainly ones that uh, we need to, to look at and demonstrate and, and then provide to customers in the, in the future. Well, thank you again, Dr. Patrick Westfall, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Inscripta, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period 
will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone. Bye-bye.